Yes, we are live. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Monju, and you are welcome to uh, another episode of the Candy Talk podcast. Um, I'm joined by uh, my uh, regular, uh, Stanley Achonu, and we have a guest in the house uh, today. Uh, his name is um, Solomon Oluwashim Oyeniro, and he's joined us today to talk about his brilliant book that um, that is now available on Amazon and a lot of other platforms. Uh, the title is The Power of Vision. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, to give uh, Sheung the floor to talk more about the book and we are going to be asking questions uh, about this book as well. So um, Sheung, why don't you uh, introduce yourself formally and um, uh, let's crack on from there. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mundu and um, Stanley for um, having me on your program. I know the early days, a while ago, when you started the podcast and you shared the, your episodes with me, it's been really, really interesting. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm fascinated by your consistency and commitment, you know, to put the word out there and your passion, obviously, uh, not only on ground in the community, but also, you know, in the diverse projects and different activities you've also been engaging in. So. It's quite interesting, and I want to appreciate you Thank for you. inviting me over on this show, um, as well as Stanley. I'm you guys fan. If you guys don't know, I'm low-key a fan. You know, I follow all the <laughs> activities on, on, on Twitter. After you guys post some of them on Twitter, I, I do follow, and I'll be part of some of the ones you invited guests from the U.S. I, I remember a particular lady that um, you invited a while ago. Mary. Yes, Mary. Right? Yeah. And she spoke excellently well. I really yeah. do enjoy it. So yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, as you said, I would introduce myself and um, the Power of Vision book, as you mentioned. Um, I'm Olua Shemwenero, um, Olua, Solomon Olua Shemwenero, but Solomon name is more for those people who don't know what's called Olua Shem, so, <laughs> so I don't destroy, they don't destroy my name, but I'll always prefer to stay with my, my core Nigerian name, which is Olua Shem. Um, and I, I, I hail from originally from your state in Ibadan. Um, I can only local government area specifically where my came from. Um, so if people ask me, most they think I'm from Lagos, but I'm more from from Ibada than, than Lagos. So yeah, from there I studied uh, in uh, in one of these local schools. My primary school is actually um, Bowles, one school called Bowles in Yanapaja. And then from there, my parents, my dad got posted to Abuja actually. And so he went ahead in 1979. Some of uh, my siblings and my mom were still in Lagos. And then he later moved us down. Along the way, though, we, we moved with him um, as I began to go into my secondary school, my high school. And so I did my high school in Abuja, command day secondary school in Abuja. Um, when, and for some reason, some of us are becoming famous now. Most of us are graduated from that school. But to, to, it's, it's that, is, that anyway. the same, is that the same school that uh, uh, our friend finished from? Oh, Benny Dupo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the same school? school that that's the same school that for which that's that's where we actually met. So we're classmates actually. Um, oh, okay. in um command Abuja there. Um and then from there um I, I moved to I lost touch with most of my Abuja days. Uh, so I'm now struggling to even reconnect. They added me to our alumni group with Jim Walk. I was still like, who are all these people? I don't know you guys okay. But anyway, so from there to Lautech, uh, most of them were Abuja, but I left. So from there I kind of had a transition. Got new, mostly new networks. And from uh, from Lautech there, I'd known I was going to leave the, the country for a while. And then from uh, Lautech, I just went to the finishing our final year, 2009. I was busy applying for universities in the UK. Most of my colleagues were like, I, "Is this guy crazy?" But I just felt that I, I had more to to learn. I just started looking out early. Uh, my parents were supportive, my family, because they noticed from my starting, I'm always like extra. So like finishing school, they're like, if we don't get this guy abroad, he's going to die on our neck. <laughs> Even though it was unbelievable and it was hard, miraculous, the family got that, and then they helped me forward. But something occurred between my law tech transition to the UK, University of Hull in the UK. Um, I, I did economics, agriculture economics in the UK. Mm. But I, I began to really get have interest in data, in, um, in statistics, econometrics. Um, so boy, it was agriculture, but I focused more on economics which is what I kind of just built on my career uh, moving forward from there, specifically in the area of data handling and, and statistics and econometrics. So the UK now, you know, village boy like me from Latic, right? Unbelievable, <laughs> I, bl I blasted powerfully. University of Hoi was crazy. <laughs> blasted distinction, we shot students, everything together, you know? So that journey there kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things. I was my postgraduate faculty rep 
I was a student rep for the university. Like so many things that things I was so quiet in, in law tech, right? But just the fact that my parents and my family struggled to just set me out. <laughs> I was like, man, I can't. I have, I have to, to make change. the most. You, you no, have I have to, to collect most. change for this money, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a brutal season. I was like 100% hardcore, get everything I could get. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was really, it was, it was a journey. It was, it was a transition for me. The exposure, the experience, you know, really building myself as an economist. Um, again, so I narrowed, I began to narrow down. But along the way now, which is where this book count came to be, which mm-hmm. I worked on, I began to really learn more about I've always been passionate about Nigeria, about our economy, about mm. the way things have been. But the UK exposure now, where I now begin to really, because my research was now, um, my, my f- main focus of my research was how to non-all agricultural sector, right? Economic efficiency of um, non-all agricultural sector. What are the contributions those sites can contribute to the economy? So I began to learn, that research made me to ex- expose me to how we were drained with crude oil we have alternative social economic mainstay. Anyway, long and short of that, I, I started blogging in 2010, um, com. all of my learning. And in, around that time was when we started this, our um, oil crisis, whether they raise the price of oil. Interestingly, they raised it again recently. <laughs> yeah. I did some trick recently. But anyway, we'll come back to that. But yeah. anyway, I learned a lot of all the things that have happened to Nigeria as a nation. Um, my passion began to find more interest in, in, in the area of providing solution. So I, I've gotten to a stage where let, let's even forget all the activities and everything we're talking about. What does Nigeria really stand for? You know, so I began to realize that as a nation, until we recognize who we truly are, until we re, uh, to identify our core identity, because it's very, it's very fundamental. If you ask an American, they'll tell you, you can die for America. Why? Because they know what America stands for. If you ask them, it's freedom of democracy. They're a free state. You know, they know what they are standing for. And it starts with... Um, the things that their forefathers established, um, Washington specifically, the mm-hmm. Freedom Act and Freedom Right, they would die for these things, right? They know who they are. But as a nation, I, I suddenly found out that as, as Nigeria is concerned, yes, we can say peace, love, and unity, our forefathers, their fight. None of us have really had a clear grasp of what that is. So I, I realized that until we have a transformation in the sense that we begin to have core values, we begin to know who we are. We can see all this change and change and change forever without a core identity, a core value system, let me put it that way, until you really value something, you don't want to fight for it, right? You don't want to die for it. So how we can come to see beyond the surface, how we can come to see beyond our fiscal eyes, how we can begin to appreciate what first starting as an individual point of view, then we look at it as a national point of view. So that's the whole, I kind of merge my journey together with the book and everything, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. that's that's pretty much the whole just how yeah. I, I jumped into this whole uh, uh, journey so far. Yeah. <laughs> interesting, interesting. So my, my next question uh, for you mm. uh, is, when exactly did you get this inspiration to write this book? And can you tell us about the key factors that, contributed to getting that inspiration yeah and i think along the way um thanks Monji, for that question along the way the passion kind of started brooding um little by little but i remember one thing i didn't mention earlier in the introduction one thing i really that i that really struck me as far as my growing up was concerned that made me just go all out for this particular um story or that led to to this journey of writing the book was in nigeria in 1996 we all know the june 12th uh, event i was pretty young then but i can remember my mom running back all the way from work she works at the i right and third mainland bridge is blocked they are burning tires i was pretty young then you know so i started beginning to spot that there's something wrong around this nation why is every day there's riot there's fights there's chaos there's on there's unrest and and you know, and I even grew up to meet some of them behind my house. They would throw tear gas. All of us would be running <laughs> on our eyes, right in our living room, right? You'll be seeing what are coming up, for the dry, draining from our eyes. So <laughs> I was, I was worried, like, what kind of, what's going on, right? I knew something was up, but as I then I couldn't put it together. But that particular June 12 event was what really stuck with me. And I began to realize that there's something up. But as I began to grow older. I realized that the root of it is similar to the identity part. But away from the identity part is actually leadership crisis. I realized that everything rises and falls on leadership. So since that time, I've been committed to finding out how we can correct leadership, how we can raise a group of people that can lead effectively. 
because if there's no good leadership, then everything will fall on that, that system, right? So without good leadership now, I, I realize things will fall apart. So from that moment on, I'm like, okay, what can I do? What, because I mean, that thing hit me hard. Like, how can people be running up at a moment that don't go to work? She was scared for her life. So I felt like, okay, this is it. This is what we call, what I call paradigm shift in the book. And those paradigm shift moments, perspective come through mostly horrible events, right? So all of the horrible was what I began to pull together and I felt a, a strong passion in my heart that things will not change suddenly. That, and I know me and some of us have really chatted about this. Some of us have to be responsible for that change. Some of us have to be responsible for that change. So over time, as from my study and all the things I've done, I broke into a, a, a some portion. I found out eventually that we, also before we can go to national change or even leadership change, it has to be individual change. So I moved away from national first, which we'll be coming to that later. But my first approach now is individual change. So that was what those events of, of those books that kind of, those events of my life, plus the oil crisis where I realized that this is another leadership crisis, you know, when in the seventies we discovered oil and all that we should be using for, to, to build the economy, diversify. So people were eating the money. <laughs> so I really need, to, I've worked on some of those cases since I've come to Canada here, tracing some of the money that was, so I, I've, I've seen this thing in real life, right? So I'm beginning to realize that every rise that falls on leadership and to make a change, it has to be individual perspective. Each person has to take the responsibility. We have to come to a new awareness of what we want for ourselves as a person. And if you know this is to a national perspective where each person can now say, okay, this is the stake I hold in this nation. Let me first get the right perspective. Let me be a better person. Let me improve on my own effectiveness, personal efficiency. And then how can that translate to the national life? How can I, as we look from an economic perspective, um, how can I improve on my own contribution per capita improvement, right? Not national, because GDP gross is, is per capita eventually, right? So how can I make per capita contribution to the national life? And so that is what eventually led to those are moments that, you know, led to me that I say, okay, this is the book that I feel we can write to really teach or explain the framework for personal transformation, for individual effectiveness, for our efficiency. Once you get your personal life in intact, then we cannot begin to replicate that because aggregate now multiple people who have gotten the understanding that together we can make a national change. So that's, that's, those are the things that build up to this book and pretty much everything that I've been able to put together in the book that led to it. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, so Stanley, come in. I can totally relate to your UK experience. You all went through it. <laughs> right? <laughs> you all went through it, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, totally, I can totally relate to it. You know how um, when you get to a proper functional environment where... Yes. Uh, teaching is different from what we know from our university. So it was a surreal mm. kind mm, of experience, mm. you know, being in that kind of environment. And then um, that hunger that drove you to get to that point becomes even more, more yeah. real. And more, it, Absolutely. Looking more easier <laughs> than you imagine. Yeah. So I totally yeah. can, totally can yeah. connect with that because we all have mm. that that um, experience. But I, I want mm. to, maybe I should play a bit of devil's advocate. And I, Absolutely. I like, I, and I like how you started off by saying, um, you know, we, we all need to grow individual, um, mm. you know, vision and mission, mm. you know, you know see, mm. to, to other, in order to see a bigger picture of the whole, mm. Um, mm. you know, national leadership. I, I'm just wondering, mm. in a country where people are mm. extremely poor mm. uh, and it seems like we're almost in a phase of survival of the fittest, um, and, I, and I want to think that that's why even though it's not a valuable excuse, and I remember I'm doing yeah. advocate. that's why when mm -hmm. people get an opportunity to lead, they want to grab everything they can because they do not think that there will be anything left when they leave mm -hmm. office, right? Mm -hmm. How do you sell this vision, you know, this individual vision that we can then join mm -hmm. together to become a national? How do you sell that in a country where we're almost at the survival of the fittest mode? Yeah, that's not a great question. And it's rather unfortunate that you know we we it's rather unfortunate that poverty is is, is an issue in our nation, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. I was sharing a statistic with Mondio a little bit earlier this week <laughs> that uh, so it's kind of a funny thing as I'm trying to answer a question, Stanley. That we are so religious, right? I was sharing mm -hmm. the religiosity index with Mondio, a statistics that I I was looking at. I wrote about 
Nigeria was the second most religious country. Um, yeah, no, Ghana was the first, Nigeria was the second in the world, right? As of 2017, which is the latest data I was able to gather on that same trend, when you say religiosity, what people that say God, you know, like if, if every statement you make, I trust God for this, it's not, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or Muslim or whatever mm-hmm. religion you belong, belong to, mm-hmm. as long as you're just putting God in your statement, it's, God it's termed as you, exactly, you have that religious idea. So most Africans, most Nigerians do that. So we're the second in the world, right? We are, first before that's 2012 but in this new data 2017 ghana is off the, the radar nigeria is among the second in the world now right so what is startling to me 97 percent that's what the data say 97 percent of, of nigerians will always mention god mm-hmm. the religious things there now look at the flip side now poverty index <laughs> whilst we are ranking high in religiosity we're also ranking high in poverty right so it, it's startling because if we understand the basis of of religion is to um, liberate you and to help you see better right Unfortunately, it's, it's startling to find out that as high as religion is, in short, correlation between poverty and religion is high. So in the same league with Nigeria was Thailand, was Philippines, and some other countries like that too, that were in the poverty index, yet they are the highest, most religious people. So what is startling to me there is that poverty is, is here. But what I'm beginning to realize that poverty, and I wrote this, I'm just going to read a, a statement I wrote in this book. Uh, so my answer is going to come from this research that was done in the U.S. in the, ni- in the 1980s, 90s. So they move people. It's called move research, MTO. I've, I've really spoken a lot about this particular MTO. Um, so MTO is they just took some people, black people from a particular area in, in U.S. They were in poverty. They were really, really poor people. So it's a ghetto kind of area. They uprooted them, right? And then they threw them. They built a whole estate, like well-developed, went and plant all of the families there and what did they do again they didn't just plant them there. they also gave them money a stipend right mto it's, this is not i'm not making this up this is real research so i had to go mm-hmm. gather the data as i was writing so they moved them there and then when they moved them there they gave them stipend that this is a new area living you can get access to job they, they put them within places where there's schools that their children can go to away from the ghetto now they put they also gave them stipend to be buying groceries so that they won't be poor because in the struggle to look for food or something they might not want to settle but they settled in absolutely now guess what happened (laughs) despite all of that can you believe that they were still poor Mm. poverty yeah yeah let me read out the conclusion for you so the conclusion of the movement opportunity housing um, experience was that in particular looking at where kids grew up now with the objective of um of moving any poverty the mto experiment was implemented by the government to determine whether providing low-income families with assistance by moving them to a better neighborhood could improve their economic and health outcome, right? As a result now, by that, they found out that people, adults now, adults that move to that area, their economic outcome, nothing changed. Hmm. But because children now, the younger ones, managed to improve a little bit, but not great, tremendous improvement. That's only for children, kids. But for adults and young adults and upwards, nothing changed. So what I wrote here, what that brought me out to understand poverty, and this is a quote I put in the book here, poverty is not a function of lack of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Poverty primarily comes due to lack of understanding of one's life purpose. Now we're looking at a national perspective now. If you don't understand a national reason, why, and I'm going to explain some of this in a moment, a misunderstanding of the resources, when I say misunderstanding, lack of management mm-hmm. of the resources, the talent, the gift, and the potential that you have been given to fulfill that purpose. Right? So now we're looking at the bottom line. People are trying to say, oh, we're poor, we're poor. But the reality is, how did we get there? If we don't look at the nexus of the poverty to religion, to the other connection to what brought us here. Somebody was tweeting, I don't know why I saw it on Twitter. People can mention God and pay God to come and revive us in this system. We're talking about poverty here. Is the first thing we need to ask. And that has to do with rewiring that entire process. And that's why things like this, you know, people talking about book. Is it book we're going to eat? But if we don't go through some of these underlining factors, there's no way we can change it. So it's hard, I know, that we are talking about people want to go to survive. People want to escape day to day. You're talking about go and read book. Yeah. But it's important <laughs> that we need to appreciate that if we don't learn the first and foremost, acknowledge where the faults arise from and know where those, these issues, the shifts came from, right? And know where they have come from. Otherwise, we can continue to chase the poverty. The same poverty some of us are trying to escape now. Our children will eventually fall into it without they even knowing. 
because as we find, because I really delve into the, uh, the MTO experiment, it's a psychological drain because you are living in opportunity, but because you, your mentality, your mentality has just been locked to poverty, to struggle, right? It's a mentality thing. So people have, it's, it's a drain. And I, I really compare that to Africa a lot and out Nigeria specifically, because we've been so grounded in this thing that right now, as you see, this pandemic, maybe we'll get time to really talk about it. It's an opportunity. Nations have opened. You don't need to apply for visa anymore. One of my friends was telling me before I used to apply for visa for conference, the, all the conferences on Zoom now. All the conference is on Zoom. So it's, it's a flattening thing. So uh, more than ever before, it's time of pandemic and difficulty. But a niche, a people that are smart, that understand these dynamics I'm trying to talk about, is amazing opportunity. It's time to break out of all of these things that is holding us down before and tap into the new dispensation. So back to your question, um, Stanley, is that except people first and foremost appreciate the mental and, and, and cognitive strain that has been uh, handed over to us. Unless we begin to, and it's, it, this is where vision comes, because vision, we didn't even define it, it's a mental picture of the future. Now, until we retrace that mental process of what is making us see the wrong picture first, right? We'll not be able to correct it. We'll, not, we'll continue to recycle the old, same old struggle over and over again. So one of the things that I, I really wish that we're starting with, with this book and even with this conversation is to really pause and ask important question. What brought us here? How did we get here? What caused this struggle, right? Before we now take action, because people think it's action is the first thing. Action is not necessarily the thing. It's the change in perspective. It's a change in way of thinking. That is the first solution. That is the best place to start. So when you think better, then you can see better because what you see is a function of mindset. Mm. Right, it's a function of mindset. <laughs> listening to you, listening to you, I'm, I'm even more scared. More scared because yeah. Yeah. you know I, I see how this um, this poverty we are in, this mm. you know that lack of vision, yeah. you know, mm. the role it plays. But I'm more scared mm. because these people have been poor for this long. Mm. You see, is poverty. Mm. Right, <laughs> yeah. so, and we have been poor for so long. Yeah. So mm. how, how, where do we start? start? From? Exactly. exactly. Like where do we start? How? Exactly. <laughs> and, and another question, yes. and um, another question is that mm-hmm. what what really scares me is like what we have right now, where mm. majority of Nigerians are poor. We've seen a lot of statistics. Um, mm. The ones, the the the. Uh, majority below living below the poverty line mm. um the significant population living in abject poverty you know all mm. these indices mm. are being used in development economics right yeah now connecting this change to those people is even more difficult but what i really like mm. is the leadership part of of things mm. right like how do mm. we because if we don't get leadership right i don't think we are ever going to make any mm. meaningful step right through. so how do we then connect uh this mm. sort of message to stimulate good leadership traits to to you know to encourage people to think in a very positive way that would encourage uh, us to bring up good leaders so it's a case mm. of you have the ones that are living in abject poverty, but how does that message get to them? How? Mm. I know education is key, obviously, um, but it's beyond that. There, there has to be something that is more uh, that is more organic, something that is going to connect at that level to to start to stimulate that kind of change. But before mm. before you before you come in, I would also yeah. like you to talk about to to give sort of like a high level summary of what you are going to get when you read the power of vision book i know it it is a very powerful book i like the fact that you have history in there history is always important for anything Mm. that has to do with inspiration Mm. or uh, uh, practical changes you have history you have economics and Mm -hmm. you can relate it to Mm. real life experiences you know so can you tell us in a in a uh, doing like high level summary of what you are going to get yeah to in this book. Um, yeah i'm i i you know um let me just i'm trying to even see how i can put everything together it's a yeah, lot of yeah a lot of i know it's pieces. a lot <laughs> but let me let me start at least on like specifically like what what where do we start what do we do um honestly i don't think anybody one single person have the answer 
if I will tell you that I have the whole answer, it's a big lie. That, that one is something we shouldn't deceive ourselves with. And I can't, there's no one book that can answer all the questions. And yeah. that's, that's important for us to really register that. And we can only do so much. But, but I, think, I think one thing we need to first to acknowledge, however, is, and, I, and this is really important. Like somebody always says that once you're able to figure out the problem, it's of 50 people to acknowledge what the problem is or know what the problem is. It's half solved, right? But the first thing I think, which is what, what's kind of always excited me about Africa and Nigeria specifically is, to, is the fact that we know that something is not right. And so with that starting point, that begins to show us that we know that we desire and demand more, right? Now, I would say that with average everyday people, how do we really um, get to start with them? It's hard because we have to, it, I think, I don't think it's one step and I don't think one person can solve it, but I think we can use multiple approach. This is just my own um line of thinking i feel we can do multiple approach number one um is, which is some of the things i've written in the book whilst we are we're showing a better way of life we're also empowering them simultaneously right so it's not only just talking and saying do this do this but showing proof and empowering and, and providing them with the tools as well to to use and to do some of these things we've said now right and so myself i'm on you on our own very little small scale we've this how we, are, we wrote the book but i didn't just it took me about six years to write the book just to put out there uh it's not just writing it though and say we spend up but it's giving it to schools and libraries right we're making effort out of our own not-for-profit and branches to make sure that whether you have money or not go and be reading this thing in your library go and start to learn and unlearn in fact it's, i think it's the unlearning part that's the most important thing because people are learning a lot in africa and nigeria but it's about what they don't even need to learn anymore Right. So first, while we're providing the book and making it available through our own outreach platform, we're also following up with grants with like myself, I sponsor university students. If you ask me, I know many of my friends, my good friends are doing how to travel abroad and do this kind of business. Me, I'm saying no matter where you are, just find your most important ability. Find that support will come and it, it might look like a gimmick, but most of us like we're now knowing what we know put us in africa we will survive right put us in one place because we've learned some of these basics of how things run we build networks and partners so i don't believe that you have to leave one nigeria and travel anywhere really i haven't learned now but i believe that wherever you are is a matter of knowledge and understanding and and being uh, attracting the resources and the tools you need to make things happen right so whilst we are giving them knowledge we're also providing support financially people want to start projects people want to you know we provide entrepreneurship support so it's a, it's a string of projects that we've you know, rallied around one single um, thing we've run, but we hope that with integration of all of this now, we can be able to reach and, and touch as many people. We are partners in Africa as well, um, university partners, like most of my lecturers before now, we are now partners in this business, right? Because they've known that, okay, this guy is now serious with business. So they, they take me as their colleague, we work together with some of their students who are you know, going through difficulty, that they spot potential in them, but they know are struggling, we jump on you know, course collaboration, mentorship. And so it's, it's a broad of things, but I, I think I'll just wrap it here by saying that best way to start is, is to use that multiple approach. Provide the knowledge and the orientation, mindset change, and show them the big picture, but also provide them the basics they need to start. Because no matter how much you talk, and people want to eat first, right? They want to get their day going, right? So we want to use that multiple platform, multiple approach, especially, and I'll, I'll wrap up, I'll, I'll close this. Nigeria today, oh my God. And I'm talking, I'm going back to my economic side because I'm just coming from Benz right now. Our most powerful natural resources right now, you guys know it, our youth, oh my God. Yeah. Now, so, oh, you, um, Okonjo wrote it to some of our earlier book, which I reviewed in my, my, my thesis during my master's. Um, then in, she called it youth bulginess, right? We have abundance of youth talent, oh my God. Now, for any economy, I'm talking about economic terms now, for any nation to really break out of poverty like we are doing, they need two things. They need technical deepening, like technical technology to do to produce faster. If you don't have technology, you have the other one, which is called labor deepening, human power, much natural resources, mm. people that are ready to work. So you can use technology deepening, which is what Western world are doing. They might not have, they are already, their aging population is there, but they might have technology to help them advance. But we might not have technology, but we have manpower. Now, yeah. ability, availability of manpower, it can bring you to the same level with technology deepness. It's the skillness and the, and the potential and the powerfulness that you give that same population people power. 
And that's what people, nations like China did, right? So if you come to check it at the end of the day, you'll be looking at it that some particular nations are looking, they're using autocratic <laughs> the governance system. Mm. Look at them. They are doing very well because they know how to, to do, to get the resources. Leadership now, kind of touching a little bit on leadership that I'm talking about. Leadership is sound. They know exactly what the nation stands for. They have a clear vision. They know the picture of where they are going to. So it might look like they're autocratic, but that leadership system works. Or like now we are chasing all this democracy, but we are just, you know, not getting it right. So what I'm just trying to say at the end of the day is no matter the governance system, what is important is leadership. Yes, democracy works, get good leadership. It might be autocratic, get good leadership, right? So that's mm-hmm. the first thing. Now, our resource is to skill them up, empower the young people. These guys will break barriers. They will do amazing things. Because if we don't do that now, which is almost getting too late, now, we have over 50% of Nigeria population right now, as we speak, is youth. There are people less, like around 30, 25 downwards, right? 30, 30 or so about, I was looking at the population statistics um, two years ago, right? About all our population, half of it is, is youth. And I'm seeing that if we begin to equip them right now and begin to empower them, in the next couple of years, all of this like coding thing you are talking about, and it goes to what some of the basic course some of us are doing now. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the code, it's the coding the right way. Because you might want to know about, but if you don't have the right mindset, this is which is where people like us are really trying to cover the right mindset, the right approach to what you're doing. Because you can just think you are coding, but you're not just coding, you are coding for a purpose. You're yeah. coding for the emancipation of Nigeria. You're coding mm-hmm. to bring about the new nation, right? So that gives you twice as much passion into what you're doing compared to yeah. who are just coding. Now, so we empower youth, really, really critical. And that's the way we begin to move from this, our poverty, to creating value. It's all about creating value. It's not more, it's just more, it's not money. People are chasing money. That's the problem with Africa, Nigeria too, because paper <laughs> is not the thing. Paper is not the thing. We, so this is the value orientation we need to change away from. Get, create value, money will follow. Because once you begin to create substance that's useful for people to buy and contribute and solve problem, money will follow. Right, so start small, micro, you know, build up little by little, empower the youth, change the mentality from going to get these 10 years in university. I, I, I'm not going to even just say go copy some of this model, but we see how they are doing it there. Give them one computer technology, they'll scrap it up in the next two, three years. Come back, they'll build a better model yeah, of that absolutely. computer for you. And they don't, they don't need any certificate, mm-hmm. they don't need any certificate, they don't need to go to school. That's what we need to be doing how to empower these guys, not creating this. Um, Western ideology or bureaucratic system around what we're doing, they have to go to these five years of, now we need fastest, shortest call to accomplish yeah. national emancipation. Let these guys provide resources for them. Give them the space early because Baba, we are going about this year, next year, once the pandemic do, is over, we are, we are gone. <laughs> do, do you also go want to quickly me. talk about what you, there was one time you and I had this conversation about Excel and you spoke mm. about how we need to find a way to quickly incorporate Excel at an early stage in education because of how um, how important it is in productivity. Do, do, you, Absolutely. do you want to touch on that? I, I remember some of the things you're saying, yeah. So we're talking about China is just more, because in terms of labor composition, China, China, India, they're very similar to us too, right? In terms of how much population. So yeah, that thing occurred in China a while ago. Ask a Chinese guy to date kids. They're already doing algebra, calculus, right? So it's not, I, it goes back to the technical education I'm talking about. They call it technical education. I don't know why we relegated technical education in Nigeria for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why, who is, who is making it look like if you have a HND or something, you are lesser than. Exactly. So again, I want to, today's not the time for us to talk about that. Because at the end of the day, it's, why are you categorizing those things? So what we're saying is, is the practical knowledge, the ability to solve stuff. That's what we need to start with, right? The basics, like Excel, those, that basically, like, if you're able to ask people today, how do you use Excel? Average, they are, they're still struggling with some of these things, right? Meanwhile, these are the basics. This, things like all of Office suits, Microsoft Office, all of those things should have been normal for every one of us, right? So long and short, at the end of the day, is incorporating practical stuff. Like, what can, what can we do right now that can bring about results instantly, and how do we more? How do we amplify that so that as you start small, then you build up on this model consistently? I think it's about building a model that is working, micro, small, but it's sustainable, 
right? Incorporating practical things, Excel across all board of, of learning and not garnishing it too much to say until you do this. Uh, exactly. Right? Let's let's restructure and re-strategize. And let's look at what works for us. Let's look at what works for Nigeria. Not the copying is too much. And this is what this pandemic is doing. It's breaking down the whole structure and leveling down the flat surface for us to rebuild our strategy in such a way that it works for us at our favor. <laughs> right? I don't know if that answers the question a little bit more dear. <laughs> no, no, it does. It does. Uh, absolutely. Because mm. I know the book is very deep and mm. um, it's something that we should really push. I like that initiative. Mm. And I think Stanley is going to be interested in it. So Stanley is someone who's mm-hmm. passionate about education as well, especially mm. supporting supporting the younger ones uh, or the less privileged. And it's really important for us to have messaging that targets the young mind in mm. Nigeria that would help Absolutely. Um, inspire a generation of leaders because remember when we were young and the old talk was uh, we are the leaders of tomorrow and everything but now at this stage Mm. we understand how important leadership is i always say that leadership is everything i am a leader in my own capacity stanley is a leader you are a leader and the steps and actions we take uh are are really really important because we can we can get a lot of things done by by Absolutely. making the right decisions so let's so let na, let's Absolutely. now flip that to the ones taking uh more critical positions you know our, mm. our, our political leaders uh you know the yes. people making calls on our economy mm. on on our mm. education uh you know technology mm. and everything so mm. i believe that this book is going to go places and uh we need to key into yeah. something like this stanley do you yeah. have uh do you have a question uh, for? Yeah. So, um, and I, you know, I like when he was when Solomon was talking about, um, you know, no matter what form of um, governance structure you have, leadership is extremely yeah, uh, important. You know, mm. whatever it is, whether you're in dictatorship or whatever, leadership is is, is the main thing. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, and I was, um, and I'm wondering, um, is there do you think that the right leadership can, you know, considering how long we've been in poverty and how mm. much of our people are in poverty, do you think that there's a chance that the right leadership can move us along to the right path? Mm. And if yes, um, do you, you know, looking at our political leadership as of today, mm. is that sort of visionary leadership anywhere, whether in small or high place, anywhere, <laughs> where we can that's leadership. Yeah, thanks, Stanley. Um, let me just first step back. Please, this book is not only for Nigeria because if we were only like, we're talking Nigeria, <laughs> it's because of this candidate. So we narrow down the conversation to, to Nigeria yeah. so that people will not be wondering that, uh, is this book only about Nigeria? No, it's, it's actually a broad book. It's, yeah. it's, I actually isolated the lives of about uh, nine people together. Uh, Steve Jobs, Ma, um, Nelson Mandela. That's uh, my Masari favorite Buka. part of the book. It's really yeah, good. Yeah, I know. It's really, really yeah. good. Masari Buka, who started Sunny. Um, who else again? Um, uh, Helen um, Killer, who was born blind. Um, um, Mother Teresa. Mother just Teresa, all of who, yeah. Who who did great things just by you know by by just stepping forward with what they know was the right thing to do. Um, and Steve Jobs did something that was called reality distortion field. But it's a pack book. I want to encourage people to really go get a hold of it. It's in Nigeria right now at Robin Heights Bookshop. Just go over to their website and put the power of vision there. And you will see the book emerge there. So go get it. Um, you can also, you know, reach out to me directly. I can help you see. Or go to thepowerofvisionbook.com. Thepowerofvisionbook.com. You will see where this book is available all over the world. So I encourage people to get it. Now back to your question. Sadly, um, as much as leadership is the critical thing, leadership is not is 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 a multiplier. Just like this pandemic kind of is, right? Leadership is a multiplier. If you don't have the potential, of, if, if like this, we see in our traditional adage in Africa, like if the child does not open the hand, the parents cannot leave the child, right? And I'm being careful of we relegating ourselves to this, which is what the book is completely not about. This is not what we are talking about. It's not only it's not go, everything is not the government, right? This is this is what we are aiming for: is individual renaissance, it's individual personal transformation that that now changes consistently among many of us that now make us to see better and want to do better for the nation, right? Now, among us now, we can now see that among us that can now champion that cause, 
But the first place to start is to recognize what individuals can do. Is to recognize your personal power and your own space, your own area, sphere of influence, and exerting that power to change things the best way you can. And by the little you can do, that's snowballing together with other people coming together within the same space, within the same knowledge, within the same ideology and idea, and then together we begin to build, right? What I've proved over and over again, I can say this over and over again, that when you build, if these things don't exist before, but we found for people, as I'm saying here now, can really get this idea and understanding of representing the right thing and living for what is supposed to be, right? Vision, to see picture of what is yet to be and commit themselves to be living in the reality of what is yet to be. They have a way, I don't know how it happens, to exert a, what I call external value force on a particular environment, on a nation as well. It has happened over and over again. Check out how South Africa happened. Mandela was the one leading, but you will notice that the ANC, the um, African National Congress, which was the party was, they were just a group of forces, right? And little by little, before you know it, they were just consistent. This is what we want. This is the change we desire. And they were moving forward with it. They were no superpowers. And that's one thing I want to keep emphasizing. It's not about you having one superpower. It's not about you having one special ability or forcing yourself to be in leadership, but it's about what can you do? And you'd be surprised how much your personal change can cause national change, right? So start small, start little, and then the leadership amplifies that, that, that seed that starts in you. So that's the first and most important thing. Now, where have we seen that in, in, in Nigeria as a nation? I've not thought of it. Um, we're still searching. We hope we'll find it. Or maybe I've not built or done my dig deeper yet. But it, they, you can obviously see there's a level of scarcity of it. Because the bottom of it, which is where I will wrap up with, what I found out with leadership that follow vision is what I call level seven leadership. And level seven leadership is leadership that is not here to serve just one person. They are here to cause that change and they are committed to die to it, right? They are not, they are not there because you put me there, I know you. For example, Nelson Mandela, the man knows if you kill the guy, he told me that's why he went to prison. This is a cause I'm ready to die for, right? So if you lock me in prison, you will satisfy my cause. Right, so these are people that I've seen better. They know better. They know what they demand for. Right, look at them. So, my, like he knew the man knew from day one. The statement he made the day before he was killed. I've seen where I'm going to. If you like, shoot me. If you, the more you kill me, the better for the cause we are standing for. Right, so that's what this thing makes us become. And so, although we've not seen that yet, and I'm desiring that we'll be able to see that leadership that is committed to causing a change, leadership that is committed to bringing about the new Nigeria that we desire, irrespective of people committing their life to it. And I hope that some of us who are here, and those of us who are hearing this will commit to that course and bring about the new Nigeria we're talking about. That's, I hope that's how that answers the question. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, yes. thank you very much, um, everyone, for for joining. Uh, thank you, Stanley. Uh, thank you, uh, Solomon, for uh, for blessing us with with your presence. Uh, we are very grateful. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, can you can you tell us um, how we can contact you on social media? I, I, I know you're on Twitter and you're on uh, Instagram as well. So uh, do you do you want to give us your our details on social media yeah <clears throat> absolutely i'm showing you s-e-u-n-o-y-e-n at showing you on all social media platform facebook instagram twitter you find me there um and then my website is oluwashionoyenero.com you will get all access to more of my bio things that i'm doing currently in the community also the the charity and the not-for-profit i said we started which is always education which will be kicking off powerfully very soon because <laughs> we just wanted to push this book out there and it will be more um, in the mainstream, empowering young Nigerians all over the world, and in Nigeria, and then empowering young people all over the world. And then you find me there. The book itself is thepowerofvisionbook.com. So if you go across all those three platforms, website, you will definitely be able to reach me as well on those platforms. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, if you have any feedback for us, uh, please, please uh, let us know and um, you can say very nice things about Stanley and uh... <laughs> yeah so um, on, on our next uh, next episode we have a lot of guests uh, guests lined up for you guys a lot of interesting topics that we are going to be discussing and Bani and Wally are definitely going to join us in our subsequent editions thank you very much and uh, thank you so God much. bless cheers yeah bye bye, bye.